Hello, listeners. Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network, and I want to take just a moment to tell you about another show on our podcast network that I co-host called Higher Ed Pulse. Higher Ed Pulse is your weekly spotlight on the latest in higher education marketing and enrollment. From headline news to social posts, insider insights to industry observations, join yours truly and Seth O'Dell as we share top stories from across the world of higher education. Each bite-sized 15-minute episode is packed with personality and designed to bring what's top of mind to the top of your feed. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Higher Ed Pulse wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Visionary Voices, the College President's Playbook, a podcast that serves as your backstage pass to an uplifting and positive view into the collaborative playbook of higher education presidents and their senior leaders. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Gross. Join me weekly for discussions with some of the best minds in higher education leadership, from presidents to provosts, enrollment managers to CFOs, CIOs to chief diversity officers, this show is your ticket to the most future forward strategies that are impacting real results on college campuses today. Each week, I will be posting highlights and insights from our show. So let's connect. Visionary Voices is part of the Enrollified Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at Enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered, all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at Element451.com. Welcome to a very special episode of Visionary Voices, the College President's Playbook. I couldn't be any more excited about today's episode because it is with my really close colleagues at Hartwick College that I have an opportunity to talk with. Just a little background, uh, many people may know I came back to higher education about seven months ago, and it's because of the special energy that I felt at Hartwick, the students, the faculty, and especially the leadership team at Hartwick that made me so inspired and exciting to be back on the higher ed setting. On Visionary Voices, we talk about institutions, collaboration among senior leaders, and initiatives that are really making an impact on the ground with students. And so today, I not only have with us our president, Jim Mullen, I have our vice president for academic affairs and provost, Dr. Laura Bongiorno, And I have Gail Glover, our Vice President for Strategic Communications. And finally, James Kellerhouse, our Vice President of College Advancement and External Affairs. So this is a real family affair. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Great. Thanks so much for having us, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Laurel, uh, you're our Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provosts. We've been talking a lot as a senior leadership team about health and wellness and what that means for Hartwick. Let's talk from an academic perspective. Um, Talk to me about uh, the health and wellness culture at Hartwick College and what it means from an academic perspective. From the academic perspective, let me start with our nursing program, which celebrated its 80th anniversary last year. So um, one of our largest majors at the college. You know, I recently did um, an exercise with the faculty around meta majors. And, you know, the question is, what are, what are we really doing here? What is our focus? And we identified four meta majors, and one of them was health and wellness. And from the academic lens, it was something that we could all agree on that we have a commitment to. I I think about it from the lens of our scholar athletes also. So more than 30% of our students are athletes and we win awards. So in Empire 8 for the highest GPA of students and for the highest average on teams. And we're really, really proud about that. Faculty um, talk about that. They congratulate the students. It's, It's really important. We also do something very interesting. Our class schedule, uh, most classes are done by four in the afternoon in time for athletes to get to practice. That's, I find, very unique and really, really shows 
our commitment. I have to just follow up a little bit. I think the audience is going to really be interested in this idea of a meta major. Can we dive a little bit deeper into what that means and how that uh, impacts hardware? Sure. And it's used in a few ways. I didn't invent the uh, the um, phrase, and I hope that others have heard it and read about it. But the way I've been using it here really is to hone in on what we're doing here. We're a small liberal arts college, we have, but we have 40 majors. So the question is... Who are we? What are we doing here? What are we committed to? And I do, um, I host think tanks with faculty members and um, every semester is a different topic. And last year it was this question, I mean, yeah, last fall, was the question was, what are we doing here? If you could only talk about four things with our academic lens, what would those four things be? And we have charts and sticky notes and emails that people sent me. People really, really took it seriously. And we've moved into now, I moved from meta majors and I'm calling them our, our themes. And our themes are health and well-being, global experience, arts and innovation, and community impact. And as you can tell, those aren't discrete right? Those, the nursing students would tell you that their health and well-being, their community impact, and they just went to Scotland for a global experience, a group of them. So um, I uh, think it's really helpful now to have themes, to think about where are we going to grow? Uh, where should we be putting our financial resources the one other element that I do want to mention about meta major is it's not just the meta major. So it's about um, majors, minors, our own resources, our commitment to athletics, our Pine Lake environmental campus. It goes beyond the classroom and into the Oneonta community, into where our students are having an impact. And it was really, um, I really enjoyed the experience with faculty of thinking beyond the what are our majors and what are our minors and into who are we and what are we, what are we committed to here? If I could just build on this, you know, another thing that makes Hartwick, I think, so extraordinary is, and this is to Laurel's credit for her exceptional leadership. This is a really innovative faculty that is unafraid to try things and to work together and to collaborate. Uh, That's not the case on every campus where institutions are so open to change and to innovation. And that takes leadership. And Laurel has provided that in the most collegial way. But it also speaks to to this faculty. It It is as creative, collaborative, uh, as strong as as any you could imagine. And, and that's going to be a major, major advantage for Hartwood going forward. Yeah. I mean, this is the essence of why I'm doing this podcast to provide this optimistic view of the joys of being a senior leader and what could be accomplished with uh, collaboration. So, Laurel, I just have to come back to you and then I want to go over to James and talk about career. But how do you get a faculty on board? We're a small, private, liberal arts college. You know, how do you, how do you make that happen? So let me start with being transparent. I tell them what we're up to talk with them about where we need to go and what we need to do. I show them data. And I'm going to say I'm a relational leader. I also get to know them. Um, I really think this is a remarkable faculty. And I appreciate them every day. And I appreciate their willingness to show up at think tanks. I mean, we One of our think tanks was on what happened during the pandemic. What do we want to do again? And what do we never want to do again? And It was very interesting conversation and has led to some hybrid teaching and learning opportunities here at Hartwick that I think pre-pandemic probably wouldn't have been leaned into by faculty, but they are really open. I I really um, do feel it's a privilege to be working with this faculty. That's great. So James, uh, talk to us a little bit about your position at Hartwick and uh, the offices that you oversee. Um, Thanks, Brian. So, uh, you know, I would say um, Hartwick, uh, as it was developing Flight Path, took some really bold and forward thinking approaches to education and also the role of our network 
of alumni, parents, and friends, industries, corporations, and how they engage uh, with the institution. And thus, college advancement is not only about philanthropy, which most people know about advancement, alumni, parent, and family relations, but it's also career development and network engagement. Um, you know, in, in the world today, you actually see colleges seeing this alignment of advancement with career development because leveraging your network is everything. It provides those opportunities for students to obtain internships in the field, job placements. Um, it allows us to bring industry experts into the classroom in incredible ways. And, you know, we've gone as far as launching several signature programs like our Success Summit, our career um, experiences where we take students to different metro areas where they get to engage with alumni, do site visits, and meet mentors, folks that they can connect with that can help them really succeed in the world. So in my leadership role, I'm fortunate to have an incredible dynamic team that's really um, leaned into that model. Um, and we're also building a culture on campus where faculty and the entire community see the benefits of having industry leaders, alumni, and other friends of the college um, as part of their curriculum, as part of providing real world experiences for our students. Um, and it's been, it's truly been impactful. I, I will tell you, you know, Jim and I travel and host uh, events around the country. At a most recent event in Washington, D.C., we heard direct stories about alumni relocating to an area, being successful in an industry because they met someone through our network. And I will say, too, we, of course, have now affectionately um, branded our network our NetWIC. So we have the Hartwick NetWIC, um, and we're working really hard to um, introduce students. And that's that's really a big part of it is how many introductions can students have while they're here um, on this experience, whether through their internship, the panels, mentor, mentee opportunities, our reunion um, and family weekend initiatives, and our career experiences. That's, that's really amazing for our listeners out there to think about uh, a new way of thinking about somebody like James and, and his position and how uh, th this relationship between parents and family extends throughout the entire life cycle. James works with me on the front end on the admission side, helping to organize, you know, admitted student events for new students all the way through, of course, to the time that uh, hopefully they're dedicated alum. So um, I, I do want to come back to this health and wellness thing because I'm hearing from Laura all to start our health and wellness in the in the academics. We're about to talk to the board of trustees later this week, and um, I'm going to present some data that says prospective students define value around career preparedness and jobs and how we help them. So James, you're hitting on that. Um, how does health and wellness extend to our experience outside of the classroom and outside of the job hunt? So how do we tend to students emotional wellness and, and make sure that they're getting the support they need outside of the classroom? Laurel, you want to take this one? Sure. So let me start with, you should look at a photo of Hartwick and notice that we are the Stairmaster campus. You can't help <laughs> but um, exercise every day here. I say with my um, pedometer that I wish it would not just say 3,000 3, steps or 5,000 steps, but that they were actually stairs <laughs> that we're walking. So let's start there. Um, we have a beautiful uh, facility um, for uh, faculty, staff, students, actually away from the athletic facility that I think is super interesting that that's how it's set up where, where we can work out. And um, right, it's right in the central part of campus. Um, there's, there's classes. One of the things I think is very interesting, um, our students do get um, training certifications, that sort of thing. And I actually think President Mullen right now is being trained by a student who's earning her certificate. So, um, She's working me pretty trainer. hard too, I will tell you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I want to just talk sort of about from the employee lens. I think that this team, Brian, that you're talking to is trying to bring a work-life balance mentality to, um, to the workplace. Um, you know, I, um, 
I believe, so a lot of people talk balance. I really am a believer. There's a different school of thought that's around work-life fit and that there are times in your lives, you know, when you can work longer and into the evening and other times where you actually take your bag home at 2.30, meet the school bus and continue to work while you're kids are doing their homework at the dining room table. Um, I really like the idea of work-life fit, especially in higher ed. None of us are in the same rhythms. You know, there are times that it's my busiest week and it's James' slowest week, and we need to respect that. But I really think, um, you know, it's important to model for the people we work with. My folks know that I've joined a yoga studio, that I'm going to yoga Monday nights, no work Monday nights. I just think it's really, really important for us as leaders to value what people need, whether it's time during the day for health and fitness or whether it's that balance of a remote work day to help manage personal responsibility. Um, I think, you know, 2023 is an interesting time for leaders. We can, there are some leaders who are saying absolutely not on, on college campuses. We are face to face. You must be on campus, and Hartwick's not doing that. Hartwick is, um, you know, get doing remote schedules. We're, we're really allowing people to have some work-life balance, doing it work-life fit the best that we can. We have the wonderful fortune of being in a lovely location in upstate New York as well. And I think when you talk about a health and wellness environment it's it's beyond our campus borders it we just are very fortunate to be in the location we are at we're a short um, a hop and a skip away from the big metro areas we're a jump away from cooperstown and the baseball hall of fame and this area is just gorgeous and i think that allows us to really lean into this notion of health and wellness in a very um holistic um, um approach because you know, I, I'm sitting in my office right now and I'm looking across this beautiful valley of ours and I w can watch the weather change from season to season. And it's just it's just gorgeous. So, you know, as we as we look at blending and collaborating across um, academics and into our student life and our campus life. And, you know, we are very privileged to be in a location that allows us all of this to get embedded in this environment that we provide for both our students, but our staff and faculty, and the role that we play in serving our community at large. So again, you know, wonderful location, wonderful opportunity for us to tell our story because our location allows us to do that. It's one thing to have the view. It's then what do you do with it on our campus? And all along, you know, Hartwick has been really intentional about outdoor meeting spaces outdoor sort of viewing spaces. We have an overlook dedicated space. Um, we have our Frisbee field, which is the gathering space, again, overlooking the valley. Uh, we have tables and chairs that stretch for probably several hundred yards, Adirondack chairs. There's an intentional mindset to get people outside, to observe the beauty of where we are, to you know take a moment, take a breath, um, to meet and convene together. And I'd also say this too, is this is a place where we do our jobs, but we're allowed to explore passions. And one of the passions, and I think this is really important to work life balance, but also health and wellness. You can talk about the fact that we had our director of wellness, our registrar, you know, the assistant uh, director of, of information coming here seven o'clock in the morning, building, constructing trails, that are now just an integral part of our community. And, you know, this was a place that fostered it. We found available resources for them to do it. We carve out time, whether it's be, they do it before work or actually much of it during the work day, because we know that them having the opportunity to make something special like this happen makes them a better employee as well and more engaged in Hartwick. Um, and, you know, for some of our, Folks, too, having that opportunity to be outside balances the challenges they're having in their lives, but they're actually able to come here and, and make something like that special. So I've not really seen many places that that not only just says, yeah, OK, do that on your own time, but actually let's embrace it, invite the community to be a part of it and really make it special for the institution. Well, and let me 
pick up just quickly on that if I could, because now looking at it from the president's point of view in a competitive world, and we are in a very competitive world as small liberal arts colleges, the colleges that are going to succeed are going to be able to claim that they are distinctive in some way or ways. We have assets here that make that when put together make us distinctive. One of those areas is being a healthy community, a health and wellness community. We do it academically. We do it in the way we approach our workday. We do it in terms of how we create the student experience. We can make ourselves very distinctive in a world where sometimes every college looks an awful lot alike. We need to be distinctive. And the other thing that's going to help colleges succeed is the passion that people bring who work here. Um, and I will say again, this faculty, this staff, um, for all the challenges facing small colleges, these folks come to work every day with a passion for the institution and for each other. So if you put that together, distinctiveness and a, and a community that's passionate about what it does, I think that's our competitive advantage. Yeah, these are incredible things to be thinking about um, as institutions around the country are hopefully listening and thinking about what they can do to differentiate themselves. I want to shift gears um, as we wind down and talk about giving advice, uh, particularly to uh, people who might be young in their career in higher education. There's so much negativity around who would ever want to be a college president. I would never want to be a provost. I would never want to be a VP of advancement forget marketing or enrollment management. So why don't we uh, why don't we give some advice to some people out there? What are some tips you would give um, to people who think, maybe I would like to be a leader on a college campus? Gail, what are your thoughts here? My advice always for aspiring young leaders is just network your brains out and connect not only with your colleagues on campus, and the network that you are, you know, privileged to be part of every single day, but network with people in your field, people who are, you know, in um, your position or in different kinds of positions that could serve you building a career and, you know, a skill set as you move move forward. So for me, it has always been about relationship building um, across the board, um, across colleagues, up and down kinds of networking. And I think those kinds of skills, as you get older in your career, you draw from. You draw from those relationships. You draw from things, activities, projects that your peers, you know, are doing that you can draw from their counsel and from their expertise. And then you get to a point in your own career where you're in a position to be able to pass on advice to the next. So again, using those networking channels up and down and sideways for me has always been key. And I would say to any young person, network your brains out. <laughs> Great advice, Gail. James, how about you? Advice for our listeners. I think, you know, for myself and for others out there is to understand your personal mission and how it aligns with the work you're doing. I mean, I do this work every day because I was a first generation college student, you know, having the opportunity to go to a small liberal arts college uh, changed my life. And every day I feel like as hard as work can be, I have the absolute privilege to come here and make that an opportunity for our students, give them those opportunities to be transformed by an incredible faculty, mentors, job experiences. And I do that through our network and through philanthropy. And to me, you know, that's, that's how I align my personal mission with the institution and it gets me through the, the most challenging day is to remind yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? And for me, it's a privilege to do that. That's awesome. Love it. All right, Laurel, you're on advice for our audience. Okay. Well, I had a few notes about this. One was be mission driven and stay there. Thank you, James. <laughs> Another one was reach out to your colleagues and uh, network. So there's Gail. I wrote down a few things. One of the things I thought about was become an expert at reframing. My day is so full and busy, right? But my reframe is, wow, I get to make an impact in so many different areas in, in my day. I, I really do love the work that I'm doing. And I really am, James, mission driven, right? Remember, we are, we are growing up young people who, you know, they're 
they're next. They're next up in this world and we need to give them the tools. I do want to say also um, figure out what refreshes you and what you really do like. I really like that no day is the same. I have short days. I have long days. I have meeting days. I have retreat days. I have yesterday, I started my day in a math class that I'll just say I didn't really remember much of differential equations, <laughs> um, but it was it was just so much fun to just be there with the students and to watch this um, amazing professor. I will drop um, Dr. Min Chung's name. Nice 9 a.m. class with the students really there and present and him all in. I really enjoy that. I also want to say as a leader, um, have some tools. I study positive organization development. I really enjoy that. I, I know who I um, align with. You know, I, I really like Margaret Wheatley's work. And, um, you know, that feeds me being able to have think tanks with faculty. You never know what's going to happen. And I like that space. I like the space of other people thinking about what's coming next and where are we going and, um, you know, not trying to control every moment. I also am certified in appreciative inquiry and um, really have this set of principles that align my leadership. And And I just find um, it's so helpful to have a toolkit, to be proactive rather than reactive to the challenges that are in front of it and the, and the joys that are in front of us to be reframing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Laurel. Appreciate that. All right, Jim, you've got to take us home with some advice. Our audience is getting more more valuable career advice than they could have ever asked for. So no pressure. You know, people say, why would you want to be a college president today? You know, I've been a president for fully a third of my life, and the job is probably harder and more complicated today than when I got into it. But I still think it's the best job in the world. And it's the best job in the world because I get to interact with a team like I have here. I am inspired every day by the young people on this campus. They keep me young. They, they give me energy. I have met the most extraordinary people by being a college president. I met, I've met my childhood hero. I have, I have met people that uh, have succeeded in life, people I never thought I'd meet when I was a young person. And, and every day is a, is a new adventure. And so it's a hard job. And I guess the advice... For folks who are thinking about college presidencies, know why you want to do it. Know what it really is. I'm more the mayor of a city than I am any, anything else. And that means that you have to really enjoy and value a certain kind of politics, that you understand people, you like people, you like engaging with people, you like trying to work a problem with people where you bring differences of opinion together. Uh, you have constituencies out there that all have a vote, and and it's important that you honor that and that you connect with them. So my advice would be, know why. It's not just it's the next step on my career path. You've got to really have a passion for the the, the reality of what the job is. And I would also argue, know very well where you're going to be that college president. Every community is different. Every culture is a little bit different. And I've seen through the years a number of presidencies that didn't fail, but they didn't work out because the person really didn't think through the reality of A, what the job was, and B, um, what, uh, where they were going to do it. So, and finally, I'd just add to the last, to what Gail and my colleagues have said, have mentors. You know, I've been blessed with some remarkable mentors in my life, and I'm much better because of them. So embrace them, value them, listen to them, learn from them, and, uh, and you'll be a better college president. But Jim, I have to know, who was your childhood hero that you got to meet? Arnold Palmer. All right. So we end every segment or every episode um, by talking about a song. Uh, we have a playlist that we're keeping on Spotify, Visionary Voices playlist, and every college or university president and senior leader is offering a song for this playlist. So um, 
I think Laurel and Jim might both have a song. And uh, being that Hartwick is my uh, home college, we get to add two songs to the playlist. So Laurel, what song did you choose and why? I chose Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Ain't No Valley Low Enough, because <laughs> remember I talked about where we're located? We are, I am on the third <laughs> level of a tiered campus and I look out over a gorgeous Susquehanna Valley view and um i listened to lots of songs today and i couldn't get past this one so great is that the, the classic version or the sister act version i went with the yeah, classic the version that's what i was listening to <laughs> Oh, I got to know that. Um, yeah. Let's go to uh, President Mullen, uh, your song to close out our episode. Well, at the risk of, of bringing in the Rocky theme songs, I'm going to go with Eye of the Tiger because I just, there's Love a line it. in there, the thrill of the fight. And I think every day for uh, a lot of young people out there, uh, colleges like ours are worth the thrill of the fight. This is amazing. I have to thank you all so much. This has been such a pleasure. And if you could believe it, I really kept my own talking under wraps, which is, I think, a first <laughs> for all of us getting together. Uh, but I, I want to tell the audience how much I love Hartwick College and how much I love uh, working with the people that joined me on this episode. And uh, I, I'm just humbled and grateful that you all uh, took the time uh, after work hours to, of course, be with me here today. So thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Brian. Thanks so much, Thank Brian. you. Thanks for hosting. Visionary Voices, the College President's Playbook, is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admission professionals find their next big ideas and feature a huge selection of the industry's best. As your hosts, learn from Artis Kadu, Jamie Hunt, Allison Tercio, and so many more of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered, all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.